two, two. Gonna um, post another one today. Thought I was gonna wait till Friday, but <clears throat> excuse me. Thought I'd uh, there were some documents that I spoke of in part three, in document audit part three, that I wanted to go in search of, and I actually it went on quite an interesting rabbit hole, so to speak. And although there are several documents that I um, was planning on adding to the uh, Twitter and Instagram feed, that is at underscore J A S O N P E R R Y underscore at Twitter or at Instagram, there are higher resolution images available of all the documents and images presented throughout. And I actually have decided to give a bit of a different title or a, a bit of a notation to the document or documenting of these documents again from part one or part two you may recall um, Robert Elrod and I having a conversation and him asking me to kind of gather whatever documents I might feel were necessary in his representation of me now as I go through this I will make note of documents and actually in an interesting way I was going to begin notating the actual attorneys of record and attorneys that have been of counsel of of a myriad of different cases but alongside with that um, I'll probably kind of tailor in the documents that they actually have already been made aware of also I wanted to one of the miscellaneous correspondences I believe it was noted on the board part two one of the miscellaneous documents is going to be shared. It is a document that has already been shared with several local officials, um, all the ones that represent my voting, my particular voting district, have been mailed or emailed a copy of, of s such documents. Actually, the governor, I've emailed, I believe it's Charlie, is it Charlie Chris? I emailed the governor of Florida, and his response was to, reach out to the Department of Children and Revenue and seek, I mean, to the Department of Children and Families and seek the uh, best advice. And um, actually, I've done, I'll, those will be one of the documents that we also may cover. I actually want to start with that miscellaneous correspondence and then it may actually kind of take us through some things I did. Uh, after I kind of share this, I want to dive into the whatever has been public record that I was able to access that is also accessible to the public. Uh, this miscellaneous document, I believe some information should be redacted, I, I believe so. And if at any point in time during the reading of it or the reciting of it, you hear a, a pause or a uh, hesitance, it'll probably be pre-reading of said uh, information that should be redacted, I suppose, before becoming made public record. I've actually, been able to view about 70 documents at this time that have been filed in the state of Florida courts that are public record, that are notated and labeled as public record um, via electronic web service. Um, so that being public record, I think I'll, the, the dive into that will probably, here it is, the dive into that will probably be a little more fluid and continuous. But I do want to share with you, and there's actually a, 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 an addressee list that I may be able to pull up um, and share with you some of the, I'll probably try and close with that possibly. This one might go to the hour 10 mark, we'll see. Um, and I may close, I'll just keep in mind to close with that. Um, timeline still here from last time. Again, there's a higher resolution, um, image of the board at those particular places so let's dive into this this is a correspondence that begins please help now let me get in here um the clay county court Duval, several courts several uh, judicial officers and several again elected officials have um this particular correspondence 
My name is Jason Alexander Perry. I'm a native of Jacksonville, Florida, and have been a resident my entire life. I am a math teacher and have been a contributing member of my community for the past eight years. I have an eight-year-old son, Alexander Perry, who is the main reason I am addressing you and your organization. Now, stating that he's eight, he's now nine. I missed his ninth birthday. Um, the past two Father's Days, he's been withheld from me. Every holiday notated in the court-ordered time-sharing um, order from Judge Michael Sherry, who was actually not the particular judge who's hearing this case. It's a different judge, one of the judges who actually heard one of the injunction hearings. And actually, I'll, I'll kind of dive into that. If um, we, When we dive into some of the public record, there may be a notice of hearing there that I may be able to speak on and recall some information I may note it here. But this must be la this must be 2017 because... 2018, he's actually going to be 10 this year. I'm going to miss his 10th birthday. And I actually want to notate the age range that this has been going on in Alex's life from about 7 to 10 now, going on 10. And I want to note, um, reference Dr. Kwanza Kunjufu's book, Countering the Conspiracy to Miseducate Young Black Boys. He mentioned this is a critical and pivotal stage in the maturation and development of particularly African-American males. Um, when it comes to the, the visuals that they see as far as at the education level where there's a, a majority feminine presence, there's a majority woman employment, there's a majority, for the most part, across the country, a Caucasian woman um, or Caucasian male as the authority figure for that eight-hour period of time, which is the bulk of ch children's lives and their development. But um We'll go back to this. So this is about 2017, last year, I believe. So um, my eight-year-old son, Alexander Perry, who is the main reason I'm addressing you and your organization. I've been actively parenting and raising my son since he was born. Unfortunately, over the past eight years, I've also been the victim of an individual who has used my son, Alexander Perry, as an instrument of discord, disorder, and defamatory practices. Over the past eight years... The opposing party, and I'll mention the opposing party will be the opposing party in several of the documents that you're going to be filed, that you're going to be uh, seen filed, as well as those documents mentioned in part one and part two. As well as, let's see, when I was discussing part two, the enroller of Alexander in all of these different locations in which I was basically forced to travel to to father my child to continue this relationship that I speak of are the actions of the opposing party. So that will be a, a pronoun used. Over the past eight years, the opposing party has used her experience removing children from homes as an employer of the Department of Children and Families to navigate the criminal and family law court systems of Duval, Clay, and St. John's counties. In all three counties, the opposing party, with corroboration from and in conjunction with several other parties to be listed later in this correspondence has filed multiple false affidavits knowingly and willfully made false claims to law enforcement maliciously and in a defam defaming manner made false claims in multiple hearings for protection against domestic violence the fact that i have been a victim of domestic violence at the hands of the opposing party on multiple occasions is the most disturbing component of this entire ordeal I filed for an injunction citing the exact same incident as the opposing party's false claims. However, Judge McDaniel, a Duval County judge, dismissed my claim stating they lacked current and substantial evidence. And I believe I notated part two. Um, that phrase substantial evidence was, was actually the justification for one judicial officer of actually enforcing something that has had damaging consequences. Um, to the victim in this this entire scenario the fact that the opposing party has lied on multiple occasions about domestic violence is repulsive reprehensible and a massive insult to all individuals who actually experience the mentally emotionally and physically debilitating factors that accompany domestic violence these factors include the demor the demora the demonization of the victim, which I have experienced via the unfair, unconstitutional, and unruly treatment I have faced at the hands of gender-based, race-based, and class-based discrimination at every level that I have sought assistance in these matters. The opposing party has never faced an imminent threat of harm or death as a result of my person. 
I have been attacked and assaulted on two separate occasions by the opposing party. Alexander Perry has been assaulted on several occasions by the opposing party, once on the campus of Otis Mason Elementary School in the cafeteria on camera during a school-wide event in September of 2015. So I'm going to stop there and add that to our time. Curriculum night, and this was in St. John's County, so, ah. and this is after the uh, withdrawal in 2004, actually here it is, in 2015, I actually notated that. This was basically the first, um, basically open house, the first open house. Um, again, enroll without my knowledge. Still take, not, I didn't want to use the phrase taking one for the team, but f f pardon the colloquialism, but again, just traveling where necessary. Um, as a parent attending an open house and being an eight-year educator as a profession, the only profession obtained while raising Alex, one would know the importance of the involvement and actually that the, Dr. Kwanzaa Kunjufu quote will come back in to kind of tie that tangent in. The only communication that has ever existed or occurred between myself, Jason Alexander Perry, and any representative of St. John's County Public Schools has been in reference to and solely regarding the welfare of my son, Alexander Perry. I have been repeatedly told to keep records and file different types of motions and petitions at this time. I have become overwhelmed with a system that has shown it obviously isn't in my best interest unless I have a different gender, race, or class. When I told Judge Michael Sherrod that the opposing party was lying about domestic violence and all of her claims, instead of addressing it, asking for evidence, or even asking my sister or my mother who was present during the alleged events to testify simply told me to file a suit for defamation of character, which has been requested of several attorneys. And that's we'll probably may tie that in in part three or four. And actually we will touch on it a little bit here with um, the public record. Um, file a defamation of care, file a suit for defamation of character. When I told the St. John's County public defender, Alexander Gilowitz, that Keisha Bunnell, Nigel Pillay, and the opposing party were corroborating a false police report by placing phone numbers in the school call log that were not registered to my name, he told me that I shouldn't try to argue over split hairs because a jury in St. John's County would be composed of a majority of elderly white women and I would lose in trial if I tried to take it that far. Now, that's a very poignant pl place because that has been one of the catalysts for that plea deal part that we're going to talk about when we get into several of the public records, probably in another county. So I'm going to start with just Clay County when I when I start start the whole process. And we're going to talk about a couple of missteps here. So really, at, the, at now I didn't want to coin that phrase again at the end of the day. But as I retrace these missteps, if I don't help anyone, I, I just hope one person learns from my mistakes and knows how to file if you're trying to file on your own. Um, this is not a, and it's almost like the clerk of court will always tell you when you call and ask them any question <laughs> other than where to pay money at. They, they will tell you, I'm not a lawyer. I can't give legal advice. But of course, if you have a bar number and it's almost like being a member of a country club or something, or like if you have that bar association number, then you get to fraternize and follow the loopholes to, to, to obtain what you need. Um, nevertheless, I do want to, I probably will have a date on that. But I do want to, I want to say missing documents. I'm going to tailor a little something here. This was one of the first attorneys and I'm going to underline because I made it 
need to spell check. Gilowitz. It may have two L's. But this this is the individual who told me not to split hairs. And I actually remember that conversation. If I'm not mistaken, this was while I was employed with Jefferson Davis Middle School. Actually on the, the side of town that I grew up in. And I was actually... And I'll probably bring this up in one of the docu- document recounts, probably later parts. But um, I was involved in that community, which I had grew up in, in Sweetwater, during my high school years. And it was interesting running into children at the middle school age who were, if you overheard this, the conversations in passing, you hear the, the evidence of damaged homes and you hear the, the, the children pretty much almost in their parents' business just re- reciting um, reasons why things and I actually remember Ron Artest in an interview I just recently heard on um, Drink Champs with Nor- Noriega the uh, great journalist Ron Artest recalled understanding that when his father lost his public his city job because he was clocking in too much overtime for whatever reason and I can even understand now how that someone can get blackballed and even have their employment jeopardized by seeking opportunity to make money but because he got too much he was getting too much overtime well that's the story that Ron Artest remembers that's why his father lost his job things got shaky in the relationship and that's why his parents divorced there's that statistic that a majority of families divorce because of finances but it's interesting Ron Artest remembering that from such a young age while his father was uh, playing basketball with a practice and preparing him to become part of the league but you can hear it, in, and at the middle school level, I remember this conversation. I'm, I'm returning from that tangent. I was speaking to Alexander Gillowitz, and I was trying to explain to him the wrongdoing that had to, that hadn't taken place. And apparently, this is about 2015, 2016, over two or three years ago. Told again not to argue over split hairs because if I wanted to take the trial, I shouldn't take it that far because I would lose. I've been coaxed and coerced into plea deals, pre-trial diversionary programs multiple one-sided hearings and even a parenting plan which have resulted in over five thousand dollars in court fees fines and stipulations turbulence in the routines and lives of my immediate family furthermore i hope i had that punctuation edited furthermore over the course of the parenting plan that i filed out of fear of having my son kidnapped and withheld from me at the impulsive whim of the opposing party I've had my son withheld from me for over 200 days as a result of the erroneous injunctions filed. Over the past eight years, I'm the most immediate member of my family. And I'll say third party. And actually, if it's in the public, we'll see if it's in public record. And I'll begin recounting, recounting some of these names. But I'll say third party to me. So let's come back. Over the past eight years... I and the immediate members of my family have been victims of injustice and inconvenience by the falsehoods filed in affidavits and injunctions in over three different counties over the course of merely three years. I've been arrested and incarcerated for resulting decisions and actions of the opposing party and all judiciary bodies supporting her false claims and blatant lies. The third party to my, the third, my third party is the paternal grandmother of the minor child mentioned in the correspondence and she has been inconvenienced greatly as a result of this turmoil. She was mentioned in one of the many hearings in Clay County to address false injunctions filed by the opposing party as an individual to supervise visitations while on another court date was to be set in the future to address the lies filed by the opposing party. The opposing party at the time stated that, and matter of fact, Let's back up because I don't want this to sound jumbled up. I'm going to introduce this party because this party, again, has been thrown into the mix. And she'll be known as Alexander's grandmother. He only has one uh, biological grandmother. And it's actually mistyped in one of the parenting plans from that was constructed, I should say, by a court, a clerk of court, I should say, a court employee. Um it stated maternal grandmother. And it's, it's interesting that I find a lot of these typos. I mentioned it in one of the uh, mediation outcomes. Once or twice, I'm thinking typos, are, but I'm thinking these are legal documents. And yes, whoever's typing them types a thousand a day, whatever the case may be. However, that is something very serious when two different parties 
are basically renegotiating a contract when someone is suing for custody of a human being for property of a human being mentioning a paternal over a maternal can have drastic circumstances if that official document signed by a judicial officer is presented to law enforcement is presented in another case or a, a, a related case but nonetheless the paternal grandmother has been involved through several filings and that'll actually probably come up through public record so for now we'll we'll pronounce this as paternal grandmother over the past eight years i and the most immediate member of my family alexander's paternal grandmother have been victims of injustice and inconvenience by the falsehoods filed in affidavits and injunctions in over three different co counties over the course of merely three years i have been arrested and incarcerated for resulting decisions and actions of the opposing party and all judiciary bodies supporting her false claims and blatant lies alexander's paternal grandmother is mentioned in this correspondence and she has been inconvenienced greatly as a result of this turmoil alexander's paternal grandmother was mentioned in one of the many hearings in clay county to address false injunctions filed by the opposing party as an individual to supervise visitation while another court date was to be set in the future to address the lies filed by the opposing party so i'm going to try and clarify that if that's just kind of jumbly let me get that in one of the cases that you'll see filed through public record it was an injunction here and there's something called a continuance and it's interesting how when i'm been, when i've been stating testifying and again my mother's been present to testify whenever there's evidence and witness and eyewitnesses ready to account the false allegations of domestic violence by the opposing party case dates are pushed back at the whim of the court or the opposing party and it's been described to me by several attorneys that when as myself and it's interesting being the plaintiff in several of these cases which you would I, in criminal cases the plaintiff is something I think the general public would rather be as a because apparently in the, the civil system and the family law system that can be interchangeable and that's actually something that was told to me by one of the St. John's County Clerk of Courts I'm sorry the Clay County Clerk of Court employees over the phone I believe asking about um, uh, filing procedures or because that was a situation where the names were misplaced in uh, several of the public record cases we'll see but in that injunction hearing um the judge ruled that supervised visitation was to take place and as i was asking and begging and pleading to explain why supervised visitation number one was not necessary but during that process testimony was allowed to be heard in a courtroom i believe i objected I believe that might have been one of the hearings that I had representation that representation legal representation allowed as well as the judicial officer preceding it allowed testimony to be entered that was not in the filings plea that the actual pleadings that were filed and I want to break that down in kind of a not necessarily a schoolhouse rock type part but one of these parts I'm gonna kind of clean this timeline up and kind of talk about that filing procedure and kind of give a maybe a, a, a dummy's guide to through my experiences of filing something and having it heard before a judicial officer but the paternal grandmother of alexander perry name was thrown out as a, someone who would supervise visitation and i couldn't even ex ask why the judge wouldn't even hear why um just a random name just thrown out for some reason but nonetheless we'll get to that when that document arrives the opposing party at that time stated that alexander's paternal grandmother would not be suitable to supervise visitation and that the opposing party's sister 
should instead supervise visitation. The Clay County judge then ordered that since the parties couldn't agree, I would have to pay to see my son at a family visitation center in a different hearing. Excuse me, that was the end of that situation because she changed her story. That happened in one hearing and then a hearing later, the individual who was first mentioned, Alexander's paternal grandmother, was brought up, thrown out to supervise visitation. Maybe, a, I don't want to say a year later, months later, in another hearing, the opposing party stated that her sister should instead supervise visitation. And then the judge said, because there was a disagreement, that I would have to pay to see my son at a family visitation center. In a different hearing to address a totally set of lies, a totally different, a totally different set of lies and falsities filed in a different injunction by the opposing party against me. The opposing party stated exactly that Alexander's paternal grandmother could at that time be responsible for supervising visitation with the minor child. This is just one of the many examples of the way the opposing party has misused and abused the court system at her leisure and at the expense of the mental, emotional, and economic trauma, dismay, disorder of myself, my son, Alexander Perry, and our immediate family. The opposing party has arranged to exchange the minor child with his paternal grandmother on several occasions and has been absent at locations at locations causing the Alexander's paternal grandmother to travel over 75 miles at times from Jacksonville, Florida to Green Coast Springs, even St. Augustine Beach, Florida, at times on blank trips with no explanation or even the courtesy of a phone call or text message. The opposing party has sent correspondences via text message to Alexander's paternal grandmother stating that she wants nothing to do with her and, and our family. The opposing party has arranged to have Alexander's paternal grandmother, who is over 60 years old, travel from Jacksonville Airport to arrive at Otis Mason Elementary School in St. Augustine, Florida, after school hours, nearly 6 p.m., only to have her turn around and return through tumultuous traffic, unnecessary and without cause. Now, let's check our minute mark because I, I want to start into this public records by 45. So I'm going to. This is only two pages in. This goes on like this for seven pages. And I believe the last two pages are kind of addendum. So it might be five pages. So I want to skip past the details because this is actually in miscellaneous and it'll be redacted from probably names because there are no addresses in here or, or personal identification numbers like social security numbers or anything like that. So let's see. Let's see about what I've been instructed to do. And yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. I'm going to. This is actually this miscellaneous document. I'm going to see because I, I threw out a couple of addresses here that were set for meeting dates that were just randomly thrown out to inconvenience the situation. And the thing about the process that will kind of get broken down in the diagram, we're going to jump right into these public records and see how many we can get to in 45 minutes. I was going to try and do about six at a time. But we're going to add public from public record the names and dates and and I'll actually kind of give another intro. But a part of the process is confusion when you're you're in the quote unquote position of power. And at this point, at this juncture, the child being withheld by one party or another is what places one particular party in said position of power. Confusion is filing several different cases and almost like misdirection or sleight of hand in a in a in a magician's um, kind of repertoire is a strategy used but I, w I would say that's neither here nor there but it may kind of come up as we see the different the uh several different uh again counties and and filings and things that we're going to jump into a public record so hitting the 30 minute mark um, 
I don't know, 15 minutes. We'll kind of race through them, and I'll kind of say this will be the dummy's guide to to filings and things of that nature. But um, this is kind of a chronicling or partitionary part, the live YouTube documentary as we address documents that are public record already regarding the timeline and things mentioned in part one, part two, and the introduction, so to speak, of part three. So our first document, I believe it was number 90. Nope. Yeah, let's see here. Now I noticed that I'll give a brief um, intro to this and I want to give you all particulars So I want to f find this other folder. I would like to give you all particulars so you can follow along with what where this public record is. And while I kind of recount this story, I'll pull this information up. But what began my trek, and I always recall having the saying that I, my son wasn't born in the court. I don't want to raise my son in the court. And that was always a a trepidation of mine, a fear of mine, because I knew once I entered the court system at a certain age, um, I don't want to say every African-American male in America or every African-American male, maybe globally even, or because with the color comp colorism being prevalent globally in, in, in a lot of regions, at a certain age, and it's about, yeah, it's about, I'd say, 11, 12, 13, and actually probably even younger than that to some. And I believe that's what Dr. Kwanzaa Kunjufu's book speaks to that age group so prevalently for, for that particular reason. But the age of accountability, some would say, in uh, what they say, Judo Christian um, theology or pathology, so to speak. At that age, you understand when you enter the court system, you're viewed a certain way, you're treated a certain way, unless perhaps you can afford. Um, adequate, appropriate, competent legal representation. Um, the type of, let's say, Fabulous, who is a recording artist, or even Tiger Woods, a professional golfer. But if you, or even Meek Mill, and that's one of the things that we're seeing in the public air right now, where someone, a recording artist, um, can still even have, he actually is still released out on bond, so there's still future court hearings coming up where decisions can be made to take his freedom, to take more financial uh, damages uh, or cause more financial damage. Um, I believe I have here where public record, yeah, here we go, where public record is concerned. This is case number 2015-DR. Is it here as well on the court sheet? Well, this is filed, but it has no case number. However, through public record, this case number is actually accessible. Case 2015D as in Donovan, R as in Ronald. How many zeros is that? One, two, three, four leading zeros, a nine, four, and a nine. 49ers, kind of like Colin Kaepernick. They're one, two, three, four years, 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. Public record accounts, like I said, we're going to do maybe six at a time, see what our time limit is looking like. Filing number 274127652015, e filed 05182015. And that zero file so that's after witness to domestic violence. There was a statement made that was supposed to be presented into evidence. It got notarized March 18th, 2015, addressing um, the domestic violence that actually occurred. Again, we mentioned this around 2011, 2012, and it's actually 2009 as well was documents to be testified to in this particular family court case. Um, 
and this says 518-2015. So we'll go 518-2015. And hopefully the resolution brings it out a little bit better. But I do want to notate that. Okay. Finally, number 274-12765, e-filed. 05-18-2015 at 2.51 p.m. Cover sheet for a family court case. This is apparently public record. Number one, case style. In the circuit court of the 4th Judicial Circuit in and for Clay County, Florida. Case number is blank in this court case. Cover sheet, the judge's name is blank. Jason A. Perry is the petitioner. And because this is public record, Saponda C. Lee is the respondent. The type of action, proceeding, place a check beside the proceeding you are initiating. If you are simultaneously filing more than one types of proceedings against the same opposing party, such as a modification and an enforcement proceeding, complete a separate cover sheet for each action being filed. If you are reopening a case, choose one of the three options below. A. Oh, that would be reopening the case. Options B. A. Initial action slash petition. This option is checked. The option B that is not checked. Reopening case, modification, supplemental petition, motion for civil contempt, enforcement, other. Where it says reopening case, there should actually have been a check here for modification, supplemental petition. Because this occurred in 2015, actually. If I'm not mistaken, yes, this filing occurred in 2015. I think I have the wrong date there. No? September 2015. Okay, yeah, this was earlier that year. Oh, that's interesting. But this was filed prior to August 26, 2015, when he was withdrawn from Orange Park Performing Arts Academy. So kind of trying to keep this in, in reference here because I saw the 2015 curriculum night and it seemed too close together. But this cover sheet was filed in 2015. Jason A. Perry, the petitioner, upon the C. Lee, the respondent. It should again have checked modification supplemental petition because it should have been addressing the 2009 Department of Revenue case that had been opened. So that was mistake number one. Um, if you have a child support case open already or had prior, have opened it in the past and you're filing any type of uh, family law case, you should always combine them. Don't wait later to file for consolidation because several of the lawyers will attempt to charge you. Well, I don't want to say attempt to, but some lawyers won't charge you some I, I found that most will charge almost like a convenience fee because you're inconveniencing them asking them to speak on your behalf even though those two issues are vitally and pivotally um, related but nonetheless it says initial action slash petition part three type of case if the case fits more than one type of case select the most definitive in this setting there's one checked which is o oh, paternity this is slash disestablishment of paternity so it's either paternity or disestablishing paternity option u through a several that should have been selected by the attorney who filed this, and we'll get to that at the bottom. Um, C, option C, domestic violence, should have been checked. It was not checked in the cover sheet. Um, dating violence, if you would, could have been checked. Repeat violence, E, could have been checked. Sexual violence, not checked. Stalking, G, could have been checked. Support, Department of Revenue, Child Support Enforcement, H, should have been checked. Or J. 
or K because there are several, apparently there are different notations, other family court. Then it also goes on to adoption, name change, juvenile delinquency, petition for dependency, termination of parental rights arising out of chapter 39. That's interesting. Four, rule of judicial administration, 2.545D, requires that a notice of related cases form family law form 12900b be filed with the initial pleading slash petition by the filing attorney or self-represented litigant in order to notify the court of related cases is form 12.900h being filed with this cover sheet of family court cases and initial pleading slash petition the selected option says no to the best of my knowledge no related cases exist Related cases, child support. It was not selected. Attorney or party signature, I certify that this information I provided in the cover sheet is accurate to the best of my knowledge and belief. Signature, Reginald Estelle Jr., Florida Bar Number 826626. Reginald Estelle Jr., 0518 2015. And of course, there's if a non-lawyer has helped you file this form, they must fill in the blanks below. Family Law Rules of Procedure Form 12.926, cover sheet for family law cases 11-13. Interesting to say the least. So, I believe this was introducing something, so that's why no case number was on that cover sheet. But I might be able to come back and of course like I said this is public record so you will see everything discussed here um, in higher resolution on Twitter and Instagram again the public record feed will begin tonight actually maybe Friday so I'll release these and like I said we may address those Friday for the resolution actually anything mentioned to today it will be available and again I lost my space but we're gonna resort those real quick and again we're gonna only do about six at a time for time's sake because I thought that it would get more concise so to speak and a little more fluid with the public record, but let's see how, how this goes. So that's the first public record available, downloadable by PDF. Oh, and out of nowhere, a notice of related cases comes. So now I'm already seeing kind of the tricky part of the system where some of the filings might not really matter. However, as I'm reviewing these, and I'll probably recall, a, 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 I don't want to say an anecdotal rep report, uh, anecdotal memory but an actual memory sitting in Reginald Estelle's office with a different employee of his I don't know if it was a partner attorney or but it was an attorney representative of the firm and they were going over the things I wanted to have typed out in this particular parenting plan and the struggle was similar to Alexander Gilowitz's um, statement In the sense that it had the spirit, it had the spirit of saying, "Don't go against the grain. Like, don't argue over split hairs." And the, the the reason I bring that up is part of his what they would say uh, counsel was that I request the the fourth judicial standards, and this was a phrase that was regurgitated by the opposing party several times, being. Uh, seeing now that obviously why that they had experience again removing children and knew kind of how to navigate the system and what verbiage and what not to use so now because this is the second public record document we actually have a case number here case number what is that 10 2015 Dash DR Dash 949 This is actually public record, huh? 
and it's kind of interesting it's blowing my mind that this is all accessible to the world the globe via one click to get to the clay county clerk's website two clicks the second click to get to um one of the options on the tab the third click it would take to type in a name a public name um fourth click to isolate that particular person's name from a, a log of similar names or maybe there's a middle initial similarity or a missing absent things of that nature so through four clicks this is available and the typing of said name and selecting one little option but it's, it was kind of shocking to me but Interestingly enough, it is public record. Filing number 27908439, e filed 061-2015, which is actually now a related case. But it's almost a month later in the Circuit Court of the Fourth Judicial Circuit in Fort Clay County, Florida, case number 10, 2015, DR-949, Division E, in the matter of Jason A. Perry, petitioner father, and Sapana C. Lee, respondent mother, notice of related cases, pursuant to Family Florida Rule of Judicial Administration 2.545D, the mother submits the following notice of related cases. A related case may be an open or closed civil, criminal, or family case, which includes all case types defined in Florida R. Judicial Administration 2.545D. A case is related to this family law case if it involves any of the same parties, children, or issues, and it is pending at the time the party files a family case, or if it affects the court's jurisdiction to proceed, or if any order in the related case may conflict with an order on the same issues in the new case, or if an order in the new case may conflict with an order in the earlier litigation. Related case one, case State of Florida versus Jason A. Perry, case number 10, 2015, MM449D, type of proceeding, make repeated harassing phone calls, court and state, 4th Judicial Circuit, Clay County, Florida, date of next hearing, unknown, the father is currently in a pretrial intervention diversion program, relationship of cases, the Option selected pending case. See, so this is actually the other party submitting this because I don't know why I would. Well, actually, wait a minute. This could be because it says the father is currently in a pretrial intervention diversion program. And I want to touch on that in a later episode because I, I kind of want to see how many of these I can kind of go through first without just immediately. But actually, this may be a good time. Where are we at? Oh, we're about to jump into an hour. So I kind of want to stop here for just a second. And I may just revisit it because I have several emails with the state attorney of, of in Duval, the state of, one of the state attorney representatives for Duval County. I want to get access to that thread and I want to share that with you all because the repeated harassing phone calls is interesting. And there should be some documents that date that detail those occurrences and actually I have an email to share that correlates directly with those repeated harassing phone calls and that email was shared with law enforcement and at that time the response was anyone could have sent that email it, it almost echoes as in part three what you can't take a hit certain statements just echo and they kind of flare up with these kind of anxiety spells and this almost like but it's like people individuals are playing a, a game so to speak it's like this has to be some sort of reality show like you're almost waiting for people to come from behind the curtains nonetheless when alexander was kidnapped at first from as a matter of fact that's why it's it seems to be correlating with 2015 um But on the last summer, when Alexander was in Orange Park Performing Arts Academy, that final summer, yeah, this was 2014 when this occurred. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I want to get that date 
kind of down packed with whatever is public record. But again, I, the filings begin in 2015 with me being the plaintiff. But the end of the school year in 2014. No, before I say before I state that, because I actually have the email, so I don't want to throw that year out yet. So we're just going to, yeah, there's an email that, that states, yes, this is 2014. I, now I recall why, because the filing was done in 2015 to address the first time Alexander had been withdrawn for such a substantial amount of time and lies entered into the court system where the repeated harassing phone calls and the pretrial intervention program came up and actually... Yeah, we, we will actually see a little bit more of this because Reginald Estelle, I didn't, I was arrested for that, but I didn't go to court for that. Reginald Estelle, apparently, with in conjunction with the other three parties of the judicial, judicial process, um, entered me into a pretrial intervention diversionary program, which later on, interestingly enough, the local news here in Jacksonville stated it was similar to probation. To my knowledge, it was nothing like probation in that if I did not comply with any of those stipulations, I would be I would face incarceration and loss of wages and loss of my career and profession. However, the choice to enter into that pretrial intervention diversionary program has caused um, incarceration as well as. What else can what else was I about to stay with that? Yes, it has prevented adequate or substantial or comp compensatory employment at, in the aftermath of its circumstances. So that statement again cleared up is that the the choice by the attorney to place me into the pretrial intervention and diversionary program would have substantial effects regarding employment after because I believe at this time I was still employed as an educator with Duval County, although this was a, a going on. And I want to throw this name up here because these so far are attorneys who had full knowledge of everything that has been going on. Teddy Rivera was the Duval Teachers United attorney who was who actually was... I wouldn't say my representative, but I believe DTU is the representative. He was the attorney working with me, I should say, or giving me counsel that I went to go seek out when I exercised whatever that option was. Reginald Estelle was a criminal attorney. Well, who is the attorney who represented me in that criminal re made, make repeated harassing phone calls case, as well as in the initial case to basically sue to have rights or parental rights. And Alexander Gilowitz was one of the public defenders who actually, yeah, he's heard all of this as well. So they've all had knowledge of this timeline and things that we're speaking of in this um, live documentary. I wanna get through at least two more. And I think part four will kind of run straight through these. And I'll actually kind of provide some emails and we'll kind of do a live little email rabbit hole dive on part four and we'll pull up these corresponding emails through whatever date and that's kind of how we'll go with the public record date we'll go in and search just through that search bar type in the date and pull up or catalog that those particular sets of emails and we'll see what we can dig up um so we have the case number count court and state fourth judicial circuit clay county florida Date of next hearing unknown fathers in the pretrial intervention diversionary program. And I believe in that program is where I spoke to someone who told me I'm not a judge, but I'm like a judge. Whatever we decide here, I'll send to the judge and he'll just sign off on it and it'll be like. And in that particular meeting, I remember discussing with him, why am, am I being asked to pay a money order to. And actually, yes, now that I think about it, this pretrial interventionary diversionary program might have had the effects of incarceration because I believe that's when this individual, and I get into the email correspondence with the deep dive on part four, stated that if I didn't pay this money order to the battered woman's shelter, that the judge may be displeased or he may find that I'm not in compliance and he could possibly, but at the time, I to my knowledge, Reginald Estelle Jr. had not discussed with me any type of 
incarceration circumstances that would result as a result of me not but as now that I think about it kind of as I backtrack on what's been going on the past four or five six pretty much eight years of my life if, if I didn't pay a money order for a hundred dollars or whatever the fee was to this battered woman shelter that I would have went to jail for an indefinite amount of time whatever would have been negotiated after a week or a month waiting for whatever judiciary litigation that occur, of course, unless I had adequate and uh, access to appropriate representation, which at this time I had not. And I'll deep, dive a little bit deeper into that later. Um, the current, and actually I mentioned a little bit with the financial burden that has been on the family and whatnot. But um, it, it's it's interesting nonetheless that in that meeting with it, or yeah, in that meeting, I was explaining to this individual that I have never attacked anyone. I've never put my hands on anyone. I, in fact, had been the victim. And actually, I kind of want to reference all of this with June 2nd, 2015. And I'm going to kind of pull this up. And I, and I guess I'll have to go in and find the date of this because this is being filed January, February, March, April, May. And actually, June 1st, wasn't it? Did I read? This was e-filed on... Yeah. Interesting. This was e-filed a day... The day before... The injunction that I filed was denied. So... (laughs) Everyone (laughs) did... Interesting. So I, I and I'll kind of revisit this on part four during the intro, but yeah, this filing of notice of related cases and it'll, it'll kind of time when we get to the rest of the public record, perhaps the memories will come back to me. But let's finish up with this one and we'll try and get to a maybe another one, see where that's going to lead us into on part three. But the relationship cases says pending cases involved, same parties, child issues may affect court's jurisdiction. Order in related case may conflict with an order in instant case. Order in instant in case. Order in instant in case may conflict with previous order in related case. Statement as to the relationship of the cases. The father, Jason Perry, is currently in a pretrial intervention program for making harassing calls to the mother. The harassing calls were me calling the same number I had called to coordinate what they would call the exchange with a child from 2008 when Alexander stayed with me on Downing Street. Actually, 2008 when he, he stayed in Roosevelt Gardens. That was also my residence. There was no correspondence. 2009 was around Downing Street time. Actually, 2008 as well. There was no correspondence. Actually, around 2009 it began because, as you can see, Little Pauls was the enrollment in 2010. That's basically where he began kindergarten, when he was old enough to be enrolled in school. And if I'm not mistaken, that's around the time when the opposing party became an employee of the Department of Children and Families, uh, removing children from homes. So that kind of tailor ends where the communication would begin. And that's actually where the making harassing phone calls and when we recall the false testimony given in that particular case it will have all it will echo all the sentiments of someone who's had practice testifying to removing a child to circumstances that would merit the removal of a child several key phrases and buzzwords were thrown out and it's interesting because as a public educator for eight years there were several trainings that we would take um, and because being a public employee, we had to report child abuse if we if if we knew had knowledge of it. So sometimes representatives would come out, and there was actually times where I would speak to them about what well, what do I do if I've been the victim of domestic violence because I have a child, and they would give me adv- um, counsel or advice, more than likely to contact the Department of Children and Families. But then the next statement I would make is, well, what if the individual committing the domestic violence works for them? Who am I supposed to be calling? 
So again, I mentioned this in part two, when I actually went to the building, the only building that I was allegedly supposed to go to, I don't know if there were different buildings that I should have been directed to, but on Davis Street, to my knowledge, is where I should have been. That's where, again, having these conversations with the representatives doing the training would say to go. So going to Davis Street and basically explaining what was going on. Um, and actually, I, I'll we'll see if that's public record. The filing of uh, it should be. It might be in the miscellaneous um, miscellaneous filing. Um, and we'll we'll dive into that if it's redacted, and, and we'll kind of recount recall that. But this is pretty interesting. Related case number two, Department of Revenue versus Jason Perry. Case number 10, 2009, DR936F, type of proceeding, child support case, court and state, for judicial circuit. So there it is. It actually was mentioned as a related case, but again, in the cover sheet was the attorney representing me. They didn't state that that's something that was to be addressed, but this is filed as having being a related case, and apparently it's public record. Pending case involves the same parties. Child issues may affect court's jurisdiction. Order in related case may conflict with an order in instant case. Order in instant in case conflict with previous order in related case statement as to the relationship of the cases. Child support case for parties minor child. Related case number three. Saponda Lee versus Jason Perry, 2015, DR 485, petition for injunction for protection against domestic violence, Fourth Judicial Circuit, Clay County, Florida, date of next hearing, none, relationship of case. All of them are checked, basically the, the last three. And it says, I do, oh, so now we're going to get into the public record. Because I knew that I was thinking that this was Reginald Estelle, you know, informing the court that these were related cases. But again, in the cover letter with Reginald Estelle's information on it, I, I stated that there were several mistakes made in the individual representing me that they should have delineated certain things. Choose one. I do not request coordination of litigation in any of the cases listed above. I do request coordination of litigation in the following cases. It is checked that I do not request coordination of litigation in any of the cases listed above. It's interesting that Ian C. Hurley Esquire, Florida Bar Number 0035934003-5934, Ian C. Hurley did not request the coordination of litigation in the above cases. But somehow later on, somehow this, I, I believe this was mentioned. Uh, this was requested by the opposing parties, attorney Ian C. Hurley. And th that actually may be public record as well, because there are several kind of procedural documents that go on the, the public record. Um, certificate of service on the first day of June. So these, these related cases were entered by Ian C. Hurley a day before the injunction that I filed, case number 2015-DR1622 DVXX Division FMV. When I filed the uh, accounts of my son being attacked, uh, me being attacked in front of my son, him being removed, and well, actually my sister had to remove him when the opposing party um, assaulted me. And I was told by, I believe, police officers, and I was told by, again, um, several, a couple of guidance counselors, people I confided in at my place of employment, which was at the time Robert E. Lee High School. Um, I would ask and I would seek counsel for people at the church that I had attended, which is Hope Chapel Christian Assembly on the north side of Jacksonville. Now, I believe it's now Hope Chapel Ministries. But I would ask different people, and that's what they, you said, you got to go file an injunction. And it's interesting enough that when I went to file this injunction, and we'll kind of close out this public document, this, we'll do pub, one more public record to kind of lead us into part four. But the interesting part and why I kind of dove into the me seeking counsel from the, the people from the church that I was raised and grew up in, when I went to file this injunction, um, when I went to file for this temporary injunction for protection against domestic violence on my behalf, because well, public record against Saponda Chanel Lee, 
the individual who was walking me through the filing process who told me about the, the uh, you, you got to go to Hubbard House and you got to have, there has to be two prior incidents of domestic violence and the person who gave me this rundown was um, Terry Lewis's mother. And, I, and Terry Lewis is, is someone I remember from my adolescence. When I was at Hope Chapel, I was probably middle school. They all had, they had children's church groupings coordinated with uh, education level, kind of kindergarten, K through five, six through 12, they had Moses basket, Potter's wheel. They had different uh, judo Christian biblical names assigned to each little group. And I remember Terry, Terry Lewis and his, he, I believe he had a sister. I recall one of his sisters or his sister um, at a young age. And, and that when I saw her on the other side of that desk and I thought about and again, I remember the beginning of this, I said my son wasn't born in the, in the court system. I don't want to raise him in the court system. For, somehow for a moment when I was filing that, I was like, oh, man, this is a sign from God. This, like, I, Surely I'll be getting help. Like, this, th- like th- Those Christian values were bubbling up in me. Like this is why you have faith. Like, this is, so at, at the time when I was filing this, because it was filed before June 2nd. This is the resulting decision, which again, I, like I recalled, happened about, and that's why June 2nd is over there. Now we see why, because that's when it was denied, but then we'll talk about the first a little bit. Now we'll clean the town on there, but to kind of go back to that, that basically that summer, now, now that it's coming in, now that it's coming in, it was the summer of 2015 when this was occurring. Um, and the f- school year going into that was August 26, 2015, when he was withdrawn from Orange Park Performing Arts Academy, the school he was enrolled in in Orange Park. Out of nowhere, I wanted to go pick him up on the, on Tuesday. I picked him up. We had a wonderful day at home. I guess that kind of shows you all in part one some of the di- some of the things we did, uh, homework he'd be asking because again. When he was with me, more than likely I was at work or coaching, so he was. And I, I'm gonna throw that into one of the images as soon as I dig that up. The, the team photo, I love a lot, love a lot of those kids. Um, but this was all that summer, so again I was going into that office, and I recall being in the Duval County Courthouse, in that little room off in the hallway where you wait to sit and file your injunction for domestic violence. And it was me, the one male in a room with about eight other women or eight women or eight females and I recall there was a Caucasian woman kind of two seats to the right of me kind of talking to a group of maybe but you know you're kind of when you're at the DMV and you, there's maybe a group conversation going on that everybody can hear but it's but it's such a small contained room you can recall if anyone's ever been in Duval County Courthouse those filing rooms where you're not the, the ticket place that's a pretty big room but even their conversations can be audible but nonetheless I recall this woman saying oh if 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 I next time I see uh, my son, my, my baby daddy, as they would say, or my son's father, I'm a, I'm gonna pull out a gun and shoot him. And I was in my head saying, this is being stated aloud in the room, and the clerks are right there behind the windows, waiting. You know, next number, take a number, wait, and they're hearing this while people are being, and it was just threw my threw me off, like. I almost wonder, like, are, are 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 they just being a little bit more vocal because there's a male in the room now, and and it it threw me off for some reason. That and but but again, that was a little discouraging. However, when I got to the back, they called my number. I saw again Terry Lewis's mother. I don't recall her name, but I remember her face. Um, and again, I had that gleam of hope. But then, like I said, a week later, I was told that. I, the petitioner, in this petition, I may have alleged angry confrontations between the parties, but I, the petitioner, had failed to allege facts sufficient to support the entry of an injunction for protection against domestic violence because the petitioner has not alleged any specific acts of domestic violence that has occurred recently, and the allegation of PACS acts of violence standing alone are not sufficient to show that the petitioner is in imminent danger of becoming a victim of domestic violence. The summer before this, or this summer, actually ending, like I said, so ending uh, 2015 summer, or the, yeah, so the 2014-2015 school year, there we go, 
this was Alexander's first first time in school, kind of. And it was a private school, but yeah, this was kindergarten. This is his first because he had pre-K when he was four years old. He was, um, excuse me, three or four years old. He was at Little Paul's at Ridgeview. So we kind of had that experience. That was a 2011 little apple we saw um, in one of the images. 2008 and 2009, um, I believe he just, yeah, he just stayed at home with his mother. Um, there were times I believe he, no, nah, yeah, because Roosevelt Gardens and Downing Street, is, those are the two initial locations. And actually, I remember when I moved into Downing Street, um, that was the 2008 school year. Um, cause down the street was right down the school, down the street from Lee. But, um, 2014, the last day of school in Orange Park, again, that Tuesday, no, actually this is before this happened. So hey, I got to pull back a little bit because yeah, it was yet yeah, still the summer prior to this was a chaotic summer. So in 2014, ending that, 2015, excuse me, ending that school year is when I went to pick up Alexander from Orange Park Performing Arts Academy as I had done. Um, and actually as had been discussed prior, and I'm gonna dig into that, the email dive, deep dive is gonna pull in, pull out those rec those recollections, so to speak. Um, but as I went to the school to pick up Alex, I was told that someone else had already got him. And I said, did his mother get him? They said, nope, his auntie. And I was like, my sisters didn't pick him up because I wouldn't be here if his aunt picked him up. So I, I know I, did, I wouldn't have called my sister to check because I had already known she wouldn't be picking up Alex. So I'm presuming it was, and I believe there were several calls made to both parties. And actually through this, yeah, I'll be able to pull up this harassing call. We'll, we'll be able to, counter with some things that actually may be public record filed as miscellaneous documents as well but there are photo records of the phone call transactions that occurred and what was discussed who was spoken to and I believe uh, her sister had picked Alex up so I was calling just like what's going on you supposed, we supposed to be meeting what, what's going on and then all of a sudden no one's answering the phone so when you're calling to follow up to find out what the plan quote unquote is that is the same type of conversations and phone calls that have taken place since 2000 actually we'll go to 2009 right around 2009 2010 school year or we may have to say 2010 2011 school year that little pause era but now um, there may be a little gap in here that we're gonna may have to revisit but those same calls were made, but out of the blink of an eye, a police report was filed stating that those similar calls were now harassing calls. So we'll take a deep dive into what actually may be public record. Some of the, if any, I don't believe any testimony will be there, but we'll see. Cause actually I saw some pretty interesting things. Um, coming back to this, this was second public document was Ian Hurley's notice of related cases. And, and, this is not as bad as I thought it would be. It's interesting nonetheless, but it's still, again, recalling some of these things. And this next file looks rather large, and I'm going to kind of give an intro to it and then close out. Oh, nope. Well, actually, yeah, I may talk about this. This is 5-27-2015. Um, so 2015. we'll kind of go, this is actually maybe prior to Hmm, this is interesting. Prior to 2005, 27, 2015, yeah, I'm gonna, now that we have public record going part four, we're gonna clean up this timeline and we're gonna go public record timeline. So we're gonna have kind of two different timelines to compare and contrast from the photo resolutions found at the social media media handles. But um, I kind of wanna detail kind of the filing process here because there's a certificate of completion for a positive divorce resolution in Orange Park with an instructor and a course director here given um, a little photocopy. Actually, it's not a photocopy. It's just a blank second page. But apparently this individual had, the, I guess, the foreknowledge, maybe by attorney counsel, did this program and filed a positive divorce resolution incorporated of Gainesville, a positive divorce resolution. Um, yeah, we'll get into that next little public record reveal so to speak 
This is your live YouTube documentary. This is taking us down quite a rabbit hole. I knew that there would be a way to kind of clean this timeline up. And actually, we're going to do that with the public records. And the next episode I see will probably take us probably to hour 30. So I'm going to dedicate just that 90 minute, kind of like a uh, block schedule traditional classroom. I'm going to block out that 90 minute for um, document on it part four. Um, and we're going to tailor in coming off of this certificate of completion for a positive divorce resolution. And we're going to kind of talk about the posturing and the presentation here of the judicial system as it relates to civil law and the, and the umbrella um, that it covers for family law. Also, as well as criminal law, because we you've seen there are several related cases that were filed as a notice of related case um, that was not filed in the cover sheet for the attorney representing me. And I kind of maybe want to follow up. We may see it in a later public record. May have to rec recant that statement. But one of the missing documents I want to touch on right real quick is in this notice of related cases, 2015 DR-485. 2015 Domestic Relations dash four. Eight, five. That's a different number than that. There's actually an, an injunction, up, to my knowledge, that's going to be filed later, maybe through public record, or an, a final order that represents this case number that includes an injunction that was filed by the opposing party. And we'll talk about the false testimony given there, the false filings and the false affidavits and the denial of testimony from actual eyewitnesses to Sapan the lease acts of domestic violence but in this domestic violence case 2015-DR-485 there was a counter filing we'll just I'll put it in that there was a counter petition or a petition filed to modify that and the reason I say that's missing because through my access through those four clicks there's a missing document that was filed that actually again stated the actual events of domestic violence that occurred and this was done through the domestic violence case and I, if I'm not mistaken I want to see how kind of this all ties in because at this hearing there was one particular judicial officer who I believe coined this phrase I believe I was representing myself at the time if I'm not mistaken his phrase was um Son, you know how when a when a Caucasian older male, especially in some type of formal setting, calls a African American son, it kind of has that slave connotation to it. He said to me, "Son, you give a dollar answers to fifty cent questions." And so I thought to myself, "So you're saying I'm verbose? You're saying I'm explaining myself using too many words?" Is that was just but he was basically saying I was being long-winded and he didn't have time because I could not afford the economy of freedom, the economics of freedom. I was still impoverished. I wasn't a lawyer. I wasn't representing myself. He didn't want to waste his frivolous time with the, what I was trying to say, what I should have been filing. Um, and I believe at that time I was going to give testimony to everything that happened. And I believe I was told, and I'll recant this as we pull out these public records and unroll it, that if I testified to any events in that hearing that had to do with the pending criminal hearing, which we'll talk about the pretrial intervention program, when I was also telling that judicial representative that I was actually the victim of domestic violence and my son was kidnapped from school and I was calling to find out where he was and I actually have text messages of correspondence is saying you come pick him up here and I believe he was saying it doesn't matter if you call three times or 13 times or 30 times or 300 times he was saying it doesn't matter three times or 30 times um unwanted calls so I was like so is this like a, a so if I'm and actually this is my question to him as well is anyone going to and this was I'm I'm kind of recall this maybe through email I may have email correspondence to this I said is anyone gonna pull up the nine one one calls when I called the police because my son wasn't at school and and I told them about I have this correspondence and again we'll kind of get to that 
Um, anybody could have sent that email response from, from law enforcement representatives when I was trying to explain, and that's the thing. And we'll kind of talk about that explaining, and it kind of kind of was a segue into what led to that pre-trial diversionary program. The arrest took place while I was explaining those phone calls to a police officer. And as I was explaining, and I believe I asked the particular judicial or the law enforcement representative a question, their reply to me was, okay, that's enough. And the handcuff was placed on my wrist. So as I was detained, this is when Reginald Estelle became an attorney representing me in the criminal case, as well as attempting to file a family law case on my behalf because my filing of an injunction was denied. My uh, Every attempt that I had made to represent myself in the injunction and tell the actual facts and call upon witnesses to give testimony, all these things. And I kind of want to talk about again that that judicial officer said, don't say anything in this hearing if it's going to interfere with that. And that that kind of threw me off, uh, kind of set me back. And I kind of want to come kind of bring everything back real quick because we'll, this is a missing document that's going to have a little bit more clarity if it comes out in public record. There was a document filed, again, to counter. And I, maybe I need to make a follow-up call to find out about that. But um, this is pretty interesting. Yeah, that particular, I wanted to pull that up because... That was my that was the first opportunity for the truth to be heard and ruled on, um, as well as June the second, two thousand fifteen, and that's why that's over there, June second. And again, I'll pull that date kind of closer to here, and we'll kind of make this a sub timeline. So I'll kind of maybe have to zoom out, so to speak, or clean that heading up, and whatnot. Um, but this is kind of turned into a, a live YouTube documentary. Um, unpacking the public record that exists and we'll kind of jump back to the key words and the disenfranchisement um, the, of the system and the economics of freedom. Um, some of the hashtags that have been thrown around with the postings is uh, Black Fathers Matter, Black Lives Matter, and Bring Alex Home. I'll begin uh, maybe hashtagging a couple of things to kind of nail it home through the visual of the chalkboard as well as in the description. Um, as well as the social media handles you'll see. Um, again, this little portal of this public record was kind of eye-opening to me. and I've actually reached out to Ryan Bink of uh, NPR, and um, as well as, um, I believe, I was about to say Don Staley, but I don't want to be mistaken. There's a, there a local news reporter on Twitter, uh, Don Lopez, and... And I'm in, in, in my mind, I was thinking them being journalists, I know journalists thrive on being able to access public record. I'm like, you know, kind of everything I've kind of mentioned and asked and inquired about, even um, again, in that help me letter that correspondents filed in the miscellaneous, that was sent out to individuals who have access through four clicks to this public record as well. So I'm going to unpack it again in part four a little more concisely with the public record we're going to jump into that filing for that uh positive divorce or resolution which was the i believe the third of the uh public record filings and that was the one filed for the opposing party which interestingly enough was filed before any hearing had taken place and i believe i was ordered to do the same thing after that me having no nausea and that's that's kind of interesting I, i'll close on that note kind of growing up and i'll even kind of mention terry cruz whose uh, mother, again, I saw in that office to file the injunction. A lot of the families that I knew uh, were the children that I was befriended in school when I was younger, middle school age, elementary school, and even at church. They all had different dynamics, and it was interesting that I didn't really have a awareness of it until probably maybe high school or so. But again, I did want to mention about that phone call I had with Alexander Gillowitz, who was telling me, don't argue about... Uh, don't 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 argue with split hairs when you talk about the false phone call log filed by the St. John's County School employees. And I was like, but this is these are facts that should be a judge should hear these facts. And he said, don't you no, know, you don't want to do that in St. John's County because the jury is going to be old, old white woman and you're going to lose. That's what that, that's what he told me. But again, at the middle school that I was working in at the time, I overheard the dynamics of certain families. And I was bringing that up to, to kind of say I had no knowledge of of this whole other world of this legal 
system that you have to navigate again you have to sue another human being for the right to be a parent is quite the system to navigate um it's interesting and 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 that helped me correspond so we'll kind of pour out some more but it's also interesting that the, the divorce resolution courses i was ordered to take i don't want to stay i don't recall I had any questions but I do have that booklet and I have some little liner notes and we'll dive into that when that public record kind of comes out and that'll be a particular segue as I kind of get some supporting documents to these public records um, but this has been part three I'm going to wrap it up here live YouTube documentaries the new heading I think I want to incorporate that somehow in the heading of the YouTube posting if possible um, but man this is interesting. That missing document is, is kind of peeking in my head, but the fourth public record is actually going to coincide with document on part four. Again, like I said, it'll, it'll hopefully it'll streamline a little bit more coherently, a little more consistently, and I'll pull supporting documents where needed. Bring Alex home. Black fathers do matter. At least I think so. And it'll be in the photo for the header, but last seen December 3rd, 2016, so far. Haven't changed that marking as of yet through the public record and through supporting documents. We'll get to that. Also, maybe part five or four. I'm sorry, part five or six. We'll unpack um, maybe some email correspondences. <laughs>